Good afternoon, brethren, and happy Sabbath. Welcome to everyone tuning in via the stream. Well, one sport that my boys play is track and field. And they do this uh, at the local high school uh, through a program put on uh, by the, that high school's track and field team. It's been great for them, and it's, it's great to see the competition and the fun there. And one afternoon while we were there, um, we witnessed something that I won't soon forget. That was when one of the older kids in the program, so a young teen of middle school age, ran a sub five mile. That is, he ran a full mile in under five minutes. Now for some context, um, if this had been an official state sponsored race, it would have been the second fastest mile run by a middle schooler in the state of Virginia that year. Uh, the faster mile and those kind of right around where this, this young man checked in, um, were all, uh, the other ones were all run at the national tournament, the Adidas National Tournament in the state of Virginia. And so we were watching this and as the child ran, uh, we realized pretty quickly that we were witnessing something special. On the first lap, he separated quickly from the pack. And his face was, was determined as he ran by, um, but everything else just seemed effortless. It looked like he was flying and his lead was growing. He wasn't slowing down. And so there at the stadium, uh, the buzz started to grow. Word was making its way around as the parents and others talked about this, just how fast his pace was. And so the crowd got into it. Everyone was yelling encouragement, especially as he ran by us. And when he crossed the finish line, everyone cheered. He had done it. He had run a sub five mile. And this was an incredible time and we could all recognize that. What might have been more impressive than that raw time is just how that young man did it. You see, the runner that day achieved something called negative splits. And a negative split in track and running, it's when the second half of your run is faster than the first. So the young runner that day had started out great. Like I said, he separated from the other runners right away, so he had a great first lap but the second lap was even faster, the third faster than that. In the fourth lap, that was his fastest of the day. Negative splits. I walked away very impressive that day um, from the track field, but so often an athletic achievement has a spiritual lesson. The Apostle Paul often likened our, wa our walk with God to a spiritual race. And negative splits are a physical example of how we should strive to run our spiritual race. We should strive to finish strong, to run the next lap of our spiritual race faster than the one that we're finishing today. So today in the sermon, we'll focus on our spiritual race and on finishing strong. First, we'll look at a story in the book of First Kings, a story about a man with a mission from God who did not finish strong, who faltered late in his mission with disastrous consequences. And then we'll conclude the sermon with five points designed to help us run the next leg of our spiritual race well. Always important as we go about our, our spiritual walk with God, but hopefully especially timely as we approach Passover season. If you haven't looked at a calendar recently, we'll be taking Passover two months from tonight. So let's get into the story. We'll start by setting the stage. So we can see exactly what's happening in Israel and Judah at that time. And the story today actually starts with Solomon. We know that Solomon was the son of David and he inherited David's kingdom. Solomon was granted incredible wisdom and he recorded some of that wisdom in your Bibles and we can read it today. Solomon with that God-given wisdom led a kingdom of Israel that stretched from Syria in the north to the Red Sea in the south. And during his rule, the normal, fra normally fractious Israelite tribes were united in one body. And this was really the high watermark of Israel's power and unity in the ancient world. And there's a number of characters in this story that we're going to look at today, and it can be a little confusing. So I have a slide up here to, to lay them all out. Um, Rehoboam is Solomon's son. He succeeds Solomon as king. Jeroboam will enter the story soon he ends up as the king of the northern tribes of Israel. Now, I always get these two mixed up myself. It's like Kevin and Devin or 
Carolyn and Caroline, so the slide, so we can keep them straight, since their names rhyme. And then we also have the man of God. And this is an unnamed man that God sent with a critical message and prophecy for Jeroboam and Israel. And then we have similarly, kind of similarly named, the old prophet, a mysterious man that gives um, some really bad advice as we get into this story. And not a lot is known about this individual. Maybe he was a prophet in his younger years, um, but it becomes very clear that God isn't working with him at the time of this story. So there's our cast of characters. So Rehoboam uh, takes over. He succeeds Solomon as the king of Israel and Judah. And unfortunately, Rehoboam almost immediately messes up. Uh, he has some great advisors around him and completely ignores their advice. He's very harsh with his people, and that leads to 10 of the 12 tribes rejecting him as king. The kingdom splits, and Israel, God's chosen people at that time, are never again united. Rehoboam continues to reign over the kingdom of Judah in the south. The northern kingdom of Israel, the larger kingdom, unites under the rebellious Jeroboam. Jeroboam, the king of Israel in the north, was apparently an insecure leader. So now we have two leaders who really aren't great at their jobs. Um, Solomon had lost the promise of his kingdom to idolatry. And Jeroboam, now in the north, seeks to keep his new kingdom loyal using idolatry. So we'll pick up the story in 1 Kings in chapter 12. And we'll, we'll read basically 1 Kings 12, uh, portions of it, and then portions of 1 Kings 13. Later when we start hopping around, I'll have the scriptures up here if you'd, you'd prefer to, to look up here. But we'll start in 1 Kings uh, 12 and 26. Um, and, and what we'll see too, Jeroboam wasn't just um, rebellious to his king, Rehoboam. Um, I've heard true rebellion defined as rebellious, rebelliousness from God. Uh, Rehoboam ends up rebelling against God and against God's law. So 1 Kings 12 and verse 26 says, And Jeroboam in his heart, or Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. He didn't want this to happen, right? He liked the power that he had. It says, If the people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked for advice, made two calves of gold, and said to his people, It's too much for you to go all the way up to Jerusalem. Now, during his reign, Solomon had built the temple. This is one of his great accomplishments. And when he did that, he actually waited until the Feast of Tabernacles to celebrate the completion of that temple. Jeroboam, however, almost immediately starts rejecting God's law and God's holy days. He says, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. And he makes two calves of gold. So we have some real shades of Aaron there, right? In verse 29, it says, and he set up one, that's one of the golden calves, in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines, or he made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not the sons of Levi. And in verse 32, it says, Jerobo Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. The feast that was in Judah here is, of course, a reference to the Feast of Tabernacles, which occurred on the 15th day of the seventh month. So Jeroboam picks a day of his own choosing, the 15th day a month later, and sets up a competitive holiday. And this shows just how far the people had fallen in a, in a, in a short time, from celebrating the completion of God's temple at the feast to uh, disregarding it, in part due to laziness. If we continue on in verse 32, it says, So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. Now, if you look at a map, Bethel was in the southernmost part of the northern kingdom. It was actually very close to Jerusalem. So it was just a little more convenient for the people, and he used this fact to control them, to get them to keep his holiday. Even today, it doesn't always feel convenient to go to the Feast of Tabernacles. I know I take a little bit of grief at it at work. We have to put work on hold, put school on hold, 
and go, but it's the right thing to do, and it feels so right and so great once we get there. In verse 32, it says, So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. So consider that the prologue. Uh, the scene is finally set uh, for the man of God. Jeroboam was rebellious. He had discarded the law of God and created his own religion, his own holidays. He had, he had ordained his own priests. And more national and political turmoil was on the horizon. So in chapter 13, God sends a man with a message, the man of God. So 1 Kings 13 and verse 1, it says, Behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So Jeroboam here was actively committing idolatry. And the man of God actually addresses the altar itself in verse 2. It says, Then he, the man of God, cried against the altar by the word of the Lord, saying, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you and men's bones shall be burned on you. So right away we establish that this man had the word of God. He speaks a prophecy that a child named Josiah will be the one to reestablish true worship to God, and that bad times were ahead for Jeroboam's priests. There are a number of parallels right here to our mission and the mission of the church. And the man of God here has a message from God about a coming ruler who would set things to right and reestablish true worship in Israel. And we as members of God's church have the word of God in our Bibles, and we have similar good news of God's ultimate future, a returning king that will establish his kingdom and reestablish true worship upon the entire world. It's a positive message and one of hope, but it isn't always a popular message. And same for the man of God in 1 Kings. In verse 3, <clears throat> it says he gave him a sign the same day, saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured open. So King Jeroboam didn't like this, and he stretched out his hand and said, Arrest him. Then his hand, which was stressed out, or stretched out towards him, towards the man of God, um, withered, so that he could not pull him back himself. And then the man of God's word came to pass. The altar was split apart. The ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Then in verse 6, it says, The king answered and then said, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So we had a prophecy about Josiah, and now we have a sign and a miracle fulfilled. Jeroboam doesn't repent here, um, but it's interesting that he turns to the man and asks for God's help. So maybe he, was, maybe he believed in that moment, uh, maybe he was scared and desperate enough with his withered hand, um, but he asked for this favor from the man of God and from God. And so the man of God prays to the Lord in verse 7, and the king's hand was restored, or in verse 6. So then the king, feeling thankful, he says to the man of God, come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you nor would I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded to me by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way that you came. So now we learn the full scope of the mission and of the man of God. He had traveled north to deliver a warning message that this new worship system would be destroyed. He spoke of a hope of a coming king, a, a, a coming king in Josiah. He delivered a sign that God fulfilled. And now some additional details about his mission. He was told not to stop and eat and drink water, and he's told not to come back the way that he came, but to continue onward. So there's only one direction for this man, and it's moving straight ahead. And at this point, he understands his mission, and he's determined. In verse 10, it says, So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. Very next section, uh, 1 Kings 13 and verse 11, my title says, The Death of the Man of God. So verse 11, it says, Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came that day and told him the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. So word had gotten around to all the people about the message that he delivered 
and about what had happened. In verse 12, it says, Their father, this is the old prophet, said to them, Which way did he go? Saddle the donkey for me. So he takes off to, uh, to go after him. Verse 14 it says, He went after the man of God, and he found him sitting under an oak. Then he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And the man says, I am. Then he said to him, Come with me and eat bread. So at this point, the man of God was probably hungry and weak at this moment. He had completed the hardest part of his mission. He had taken the message of God to Jeroboam. And this was no small task. You know, I'm tired sometimes after giving presentations at work, and that's in front of a relatively friendly audience, not delivering a, a big message to a hostile audience like the king. So he was probably tired. Um, he had then, the man of God, refused the king's offer for food, drink, and rest. And here he is on the side of the road, finally taking a break from his travels and his mission. He's resting under a tree alongside the road, probably physically and emotionally tired. So this must have been a tempting offer. In verse 16, the man of God said, I cannot return with you, nor go in with you, neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by the way that I came. So the man of God knows the right thing to do. It's been drilled into my head, know the right, choose the right, do the right. He knows it. He's choosing it, it seems like, but what does he do? Verse 18, he, the prophet, said to the man of God, I, too, am a prophet like you are. And this prophet is leading with a half-truth. You know, the Bible never tells us that this man is a false prophet. So maybe he was a prophet in his younger days that had, at one time, delivered messages for God. But we see here that he's not currently delivering an honest message. He says, I'm a prophet, as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. And then in parentheses, at least in my translation, it actually says he was lying to him. But verse 19, it says, So he, the man of God, went back with him, ate bread in his house, and drank water. Now it happened, in verse 20, as they sat on the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet. So this is the old prophet that had just lied. Now the prophet had a real message from God. In verse 21, thus says the Lord, says the prophet, because you, man of God, have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate the bread, and drank the water in the place that the Lord said to you, eat no bread and drink no water, your corpse shall not come home to the tomb of your fathers. Verse 23, so it was after he'd eaten bread and had drunk, he saddled his donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. Man of God on the road and killed him. So this is disastrous. The man of God faltered on the last lap of his spiritual race and turned around, and it cost him his life. Continuing on verse 24, his body was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by it, and the lion also stood by the corpse. And there men passed and saw the corpse thrown on the road, and the lion standing by the corpse. Then they went in, they went to the city where the old prophet dwelt, and they, they told everyone. You know, this is very strange. It's a, it's a grisly story in a lot of ways, um, but there are kingdom images here as well. Clearly God's hand was in this. God has power over the animal kingdom. Because typically, donkeys don't casually just hang out with lions, uh, especially after their owner is attacked by that lion. They would run away, um, screaming however donkeys scream, I imagine, right? Um, but the, the donkey doesn't flee the lion here, and the lion doesn't mess with the man's body or eat it. He doesn't attack the donkey. They just sit there and, and hang out. Um, so people were passing this truly bizarre scene. And this is a further warning to the people and to Jeroboam to witness it, to repent, and to take God's message seriously, something that the old man didn't do well enough. The people who see this on the side of the road, they, they get it, and they spread the word about this prophecy. So in verses 26 and on, the old prophet who serves as the stumbling block in this story, he goes to the man of God and collects his body and buries him in his own tomb. Um, if we read on in verse uh, 33, it says that after this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, so he didn't um, heed the word of God and the warnings and all the signs. 
In verse 34, it says, this thing was a sin of the house of Jeroboam so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. So this means that it led to his downfall and the downfall of his, uh, downfall of his entire family line. Um, if we were to read on, we would read about another prophet named uh, Ahijah that comes, and Jeroboam and his family is indeed cut off. And Jeroboam's great legacy is as the leader who caused Israel to sin. All of the other prophecies of the man of God come to pass as well. It would take 300 years, but a king named Josiah came. He destroyed the idols in the high places, ended sacrifices to Molech, and reestablished true worship. If you read this on a straight read through through this section of the Bible, the arrival of Josiah reads like a great crescendo. You know, finally, someone after all these kings that did all this evil in the sight of the Lord reestablished true worship, believes in God, and is willing to do something about it. It will be so much more refreshing when Jesus Christ returns and perfectly reestablishes true worship on earth. And God's word always comes to pass. So that's the story of the man in 1 Kings. And the part of the story that I've always struggled with the most <clears throat> is that his mission was almost over, right? He'd kind of done the hard part. He had almost made it. He had delivered God's message to Jeroboam and God's people. He'd resisted temptation multiple times. He was on the way out of town. He just had to walk a little while longer. But the old prophet pursued him. Just as the armies pursued the Israelites out of Egypt and just as sin pursues us today, seeking to overtake us and entrap us. A biblical scholar and teacher named Dr. J. Robert Clinton studied the lives of over 1,000 biblical characters. And he discovered that fewer than 30%, and this is characters in our Bible, fewer than 30% finished their race well. All of these characters started their race strong but eventually faltered. And this statistic really surprised me. But our story today has at least three examples in the story that we read today. Solomon started strong, the wisest person on earth. Rebuilt God's kingdom, but he succumbed to idolatry. The man of God completed most of his mission successfully, but then turned back. And even Josiah, that destined king to come, had an incredible start to his life, but even one of the two accounts of his death in the Bible attributes his death to a sin that he commits. Paul wrote a lot about this issue, urging his congregations to finish strong. And the race of faith was a recurring theme in his writing. No matter where we are in our spiritual race today, we could be having maybe the best spiritual year of our life, or we could be a bit tired on the side of the road, like the old man or the man of God in the story. We should always be looking at that next lap of our spiritual race and striving to run it faster than the last. So with the remaining time, we'll have five steps designed to help us run the next leg of our spiritual race well. Point number one is to set a goal. Oops, I missed a whole lot of slides. Let's see. Okay, there we go. So point number one is to set a goal. Uh, going back to the race about the runner at the track that afternoon, uh, he ran faster and faster because he was pressing towards something. As he flew by me, I could see the look of determination in his face. You know, he wanted to finish under five minutes, to have his best time ever, to impress his future high school teammates maybe, to qualify for nationals maybe. When Paul wrote about the race of faith, he was always focused on the goal. Philippians 3 and verse 12 says that, not that I have already attained or that I am perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of for me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. The word here that Paul uses is skopos um, for goal. And the root of this word comes from a sentry or a scout, keeping an eye on the horizon. And Paul writes to keep the eye on the goal and push towards it. Experts have discovered that we're more likely to achieve our goals if our goals are tied to what's called intrinsic rewards instead of extrinsic awards. So extrinsic rewards are external motivators. Examples of this could be a higher salary at work or extra video game time from your parents. So a couple boys just look up just at the thought of that, right? 
It sounds great, but it's proven that intrinsic rewards actually resonate deeper with us and we're more likely to hit those goals. Um, intrinsic rewards um, are, you know, come from internal motivation. So I'll give you an example. So think about which of these um, you know, goals uh, tied to a purpose would be more powerful. Uh, I want to eat less red meat because I have high cholesterol and I want my next cholesterol test to be better. Or I want to eat less red meat because I never met my grandfathers because they both died young. And I want to meet my grandkids and to help raise them. You know, one is an, an external award, sort of like a report card, a score that's disconnected from what we want to do. The other goes to the core of who I am as a person and how I set, how I want to set goals in line with that. I wanted to cover this because we are, at least I, this time of year, I tend to pluck a lot of advice from Paul and just like take his lists, right? Lists about the fruit that I should be producing or, or how to live, the behaviors that I should be developing. But for Paul, his words are always tied to purpose. His words are just soaked in it. In this section of scripture in verse 8, he writes that he counts everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. In verse 9, he says that everything else is rubbish to him in order to gain Christ. In verse 11, he prefaces his words about finishing the race by saying that by any means possible he wants to attain the resurrection. It's a great example for us. We should prayerfully involve God from the start, working with God, identify our Passover goals and all spiritual goals, and be sure we tie those to God's ultimate purpose and the role that we have within the family that he's creating. And if we do that, we're going to have more success meeting those spiritual goals. Point number two is to make a plan. Now, I'll, admit, I'll, I'll admit that very often I've set goals and, and not really done um, deep planning behind it. Sometimes I've even hit those goals, but I, I just tend to hit a wall, right? And it's like, all right, I did that. What next? Uh, when runners set a goal, and, and this surprised me actually, um, with runners, I, I thought that they probably just like ran six miles this week and then next week maybe seven miles a little faster. Um, but they set very detailed goals. Um, they develop a, a schedule of speed work, uh, tempo runs, easy days, long days, all planned down to very specific paces, uh, down to the lap pace. Uh, they crunch the numbers to get the pace exactly right. Then they have nutritional planning, a diet that supports training and specific foods the week of the run. And unless you're an elite runner, usually all this training is just to, it's just to improve your own time, your own race, to hit those goals that you've set for yourself uh, or to qualify for other races. Now, Paul knew all of this. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9 and verse 24, he wrote, Do you not know that in a race all the, ra all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we have an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. So Paul stresses preparation instead of aimlessness, discipline over frantic efforts. And the Bible is filled with advice about planning. The, Pro uh, the Proverbs 31 woman is, is one of the best, if not the best, example of a business leader in the entire Bible. And she is purposeful and she plans. Before she buys the field, she considers it carefully. After she buys it, she executes her plan planting a vineyard in the field and making a profit. Paul elsewhere likens us to a field. If we want to be fruit-bearing, profitable fields of God, we should likewise carefully plan our goals. All this, planet, all this planning is, of course, for naught if God doesn't bless our efforts. Psalm 127, I think we sang this song just last week, and it's a favorite for many of God's people. So we need to involve God from the start and every step along the way. And we should strive to seek first his will and not add him to the process midstream um, when, we're, when we're trying to uh, achieve goals. Psalm 127 and verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. 
Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. A step or point number three today. On our spiritual race, be aware of stumbling blocks and distractions. <clears throat> as much as possible, we want to approach our spiritual race mentally prepared for anything that could come up. And that includes distractions, uh, stumbling blocks, trials. A runner's plan that I was talking about earlier is it's a blend of runs and other workouts. And a lot of running plans for a race only involve three actual runs per week, and the rest is, is other training. But all of those races are meant to physic not only physically prepare the runner, but also mentally prepare the runner for anything that could come up on race day. Uh, one thing that runners apply during races, and people apply uh, when trying to do hard things, are affirmations. And those are ways to refocus our mind on the goal. They help people push through the hard times and moments when they have physical issues or doubts, moments when they want to give up. We have affirmations as well, or really something better. Uh, we have the Word of God, which we know and we're actively studying. We have memory scriptures and even memory hymns that we can pull on at a moment's notice when things get tough. One great example I heard about this um, years ago was in a sermonette by, by Mr. Leif Kareliason. Um, he said that his favorite scripture is Philippians 4 and verse 13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's a simple scripture but powerful. It's easy to remember and easy to pull on at a moment's notice. And Mr. Kareliason described using it to refocus his mind when things get tough. God's word is called the sword of the spirit. We can wield it to cut through distractions, help us fight through trials, and keep us moving towards our ultimate goal. Fourth step, fourth point today, is to share our plan with others. And the next two points go hand in hand. And Carl did a great job of covering this concept last week um, when he talked about sharing each other's burdens and sharing what we're going through with each other and being there for each other. If we share our plan with others, family, brethren, friends, we're more likely to achieve it. Accountability helps. Ecclesiastes 4 <clears throat> and verse 12 says, Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That brings us to our final related point, and that's to help each other along the way. Running is often presented as an individual sport. I think that's, that's fair. There's a ton of individual um, you know, goals and, and striving to meet that goal, but there's also tons of support within the running community. In the first race I ever ran, just a you know, 5K, I was surprised when one of the leading runners finished the race, um, you know, top five, and he turned right around and walked and jogged back up the last leg of that race, encouraging everyone that he passed. He was calling out, you've got it, and finish strong. We started the sermon with the story of a young man who ran a sub five mile and finished stronger than he started. And it was an incredible example of individual sports achievement, but he did have help. There were the coaches who had coached him leading up to that race and were there to encourage him that day. There were teammates, not in the current race, that were on the sidelines that were cheering him on. And there was a crowd cheering him on louder and louder as he went. He also had pace setters. And pace setters, they're sometimes called rabbits. And they set a, a pace ahead of the fastest runners. Uh, normally, a single high school athlete could set the pace for um, kind of a ragtag group of middle schoolers, um, but not on this day. In this case, the young athlete was too fast. The pace setter needed to tag in a teammate to run the second half of the race. Fresh legs to set an aggressive pace that the runner could chase after. When the runner passed that finish line, everyone celebrated. The entire stadium was behind him. Track and field is a team sport, and the running community is tightly knit and encouraging. So is the Church of God, and so is this congregation. This year, we can continue to encourage each other on our spiritual races, striving to help each other run our best spiritual lap yet. We do have an incredible God that offers us limitless help and encouragement, and Paul calls him the God of comfort. In 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3, he wrote, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who 
who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. And Paul says to pay that comfort forward, the comfort that we get from God. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9, um, Paul, it's from the, the closing of the letter. Paul has written the Thessalonians about their relationship with each other, about mourning for the dead, and about the return of Jesus Christ. As he begins his closing exhortations and encouragement, he tells them to comfort and edify each other while acknowledging that they are known for doing this very thing. In verse 11, he wrote, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Now, my family and I have found this to be a very encouraging congregation since joining it. So like Paul wrote, let's continue to comfort and encourage each other as we go forward into the Passover season. To conclude, brethren, let's strive to have negative splits in our spiritual race. Let's involve God from the start and in every step along the way. As we set a goal, make a plan, and move out on it, let's wield the sword of the Spirit to encourage ourselves and to cut through any distractions. And let's help each other along the way. Let's make this next lap of our spiritual race our strongest one yet. Yeah.